Yet another member of the Trump White House just got a subpoena from the bipartisan committee investigating the January 6th insurrection. Peter Navarro was one of Trump's top trade advisors. He also took a direct role in plotting the attempted coup. He's a man of many talents. He's been pretty open about it. Navarro calls the plan the, quote, Green Bay Sweep. And not only did he write a book about it in his book, he was literally just on MSNBC on the beat with Ari Melber, boasting about the plot he cooked up with Steve Bannon. We had uh, over 100 congressmen and senators on Capitol Hill ready to implement the sweep. The sweep was simply that. We were going to challenge the, the results of the election in the six battleground states. They were Michigan, Pennsylvania, uh, Georgia, Wisconsin, uh, uh, Nevada. And, and basically, these were the places where we believed that if the votes were sent back to those battleground states, and looked at again that there would be enough concern amongst the legislatures that m most or all of those states would decertify the election that would throw the election to the House of Representatives. Do you realize you are describing a coup? No. Going to side with Ari on that one. That was just last month. Navarro told another journalist Trump was on board with the strategy and that Representative Paul Gosar and Senator Ted Cruz were among the 100 lawmakers ready to implement the plan. Neither Cruz, nor Gosar, nor Navarro, nor Trump have really faced any kind of legal repercussions for their plans on January 6th. But, of course, hundreds of people who stormed the Capitol have. Like this woman, Dr. Simone Gold, seen here with a bullhorn inside the Capitol on January 6th. Gold is the founder of a group called America's Frontline Doctors, which sprung up last year decrying lockdowns, pushing debunked COVID treatments like hydroxychloroquine and spewing anti-vax rhetoric. Gold was already in D.C. for an anti-vaccine rally on January 5th and then joined the crowd at the Capitol the next day. We know she was there because, well, she told The Washington Post all about it just days later, confirming, quote, she went inside the Capitol, saying she followed a crowd and assumed it was legal to do so. She also told the paper she regretted being there. Well, Dr. Simone Gold was arrested soon after that interview and charged with five counts, including obstructing an official proceeding. She originally, originally pled not guilty and then yesterday reached a plea deal with prosecutors. We still don't know the details of that deal. Dr. Gold is still out and about peddling anti-vax nonsense. Zoe Tillman is a senior legal reporter for BuzzFeed News, where she's been covering the prosecutions from the January 6th insurrection, and she joins me now. Zoe, what can you tell us about Dr. Gold's case? You know, her case, in one sense, is one of the more high-profile ones, just because she is a known entity. She was a speaker at the rally, the, the Health Freedom Rally, the day before January 6th. Um, you know, one of the, the more bold-faced names that we've seen prosecuted. In another sense, her case is one of the more garden-variety ones that we've seen uh, in the context of 730-plus cases. Um, she's not charged with assaulting police. She's not charged with conspiracy. Uh, she was indicted along with an associate, John Strand, of obstructing an official proceeding, which is one of the most serious felonies that's been charged in these cases. It's been a way for prosecutors to to differentiate between the, the rioters who, you know, the evidence is really just that they, they walked in and they walked out versus defendants where the government believes there's more evidence of their intent, that they went in to obstruct what Congress was doing that day. And Simone Gold's case is one of those, you know, whether her plea deal uh, it takes her down to just a misdemeanor count, which has been common in some of the plea deals we've seen so far, where people charged with felonies have, have taken a deal for one of the lesser charges. Uh, we still need to, to see what the terms of the deal are. Um, but, you know, in one sense, her case is, is quite notable. And in another sense, it's quite illustrative of what we've seen so far. Well, what's, what's striking to me, too, is the kind of joined at the hip nature of these two ideological factions in American life, the Health Freedom Rally on the 5th and the people that stormed the Capitol on the 6th with uh, Dr. Gold in the Venn diagram. I mean, America's Frontline Doctors, which she founded, is not a fringe group insofar as it has been cited by Republicans uh, in, in many circumstances. They've appeared in congressional testimony, uh, I think in Ron Johnson's committee, if I'm not mistaken. Um, the current Florida Surgeon General, Joseph Latipo, um, has appeared on stage with Dr. Gold. Uh, so this this group is very much front and center in Republican pandemic politics. 
It, it is. That's right. And it's it's worth noting that um, Dr. Gold is a licensed doctor in California. Her medical license is current. Um, you know, once she pleads guilty and is convicted of a crime, that is something that will need to be reported to the medical board. It doesn't mm-hmm. necessarily mean that she will lose her medical license. Um, but, you know, I think January 6th was really a convergence of a lot of grievances separate uh, but intertwined mm-hmm. with the election. And so there are other defendants who had gone to the Health Freedom Rally, were carrying signs about their opposition to vaccines and masks and lockdowns, who had uh, really joined together the idea that their their anger at the handling of the pandemic was related to what they saw as a stolen election. It was this, this really broad airing of grievances at the Capitol. Um, and I think Dr. Gold is really sits at the center of that that confluence. Final question for you is the timeline here. It's just, it's interesting to me. I mean, uh, w- something we've returned to time and again on the reporting on this, largely from you and Ryan Riley, um, it's just the kind of logistical processing that this is taking, particularly for that D.C. U.S. Attorney's Office, that, you know, she was arrested a year ago and just kind of hanging out there and entering a plea today. Is that timeline fairly typical? It is. For defendants who are not kept in jail after their arrest. They aren't considered threats uh, going forward to the community allowed to go home. They've been considered less of a priority uh, in terms of moving things along with production of evidence, setting schedules. We know back in December, I believe, that a plea offer had been extended, uh, which is typical for cases that aren't just misdemeanor cases, the misdemeanor cases being the first wave of plea deals, now moving into some of the felony uh, cases, getting plea offers extended and deciding whether to take those or go to trial. Um, So it it does. It does fit the timeline, but it's a long, long timeline, and we have a ways to go. All right, Zoe Tillman, great reporting as always. Thank you.